I'm in Bangladesh. The sun is rising in Bangladesh, and with it brings the start of a new calendar month. We are now entering the month of Boishak, also known as the annual month for harvesting rice. This local village market is usually bustling at these early hours, yet today it is completely deserted and for a rather unusual reason. The first day of Boishak this year just so happens to be the start of the religious month of Ramadan for Muslims as well. Bangladesh is a predominantly Muslim country, with 90% of the population following Islam. This makes it one of the largest majority Muslim nations in the world. Once a year, Muslims are required to practice the month of Ramadan. This means having no food or water during the hours of daylight. I've been in Bangladesh for four months now, and this is my third trip to the country. My family compound is located in a rural and poverty-stricken village not far from the Indian border. Living in this third world country could not be more different to my normal life in the UK. In England, I could only dream of having my own pet monkey. This is Pablo. He is nearly seven months old now and he is a rhesus macaque monkey. Smacking his lips is Pablo's way of giving you a friendly hello. Allow me to give you a closer look at my family compound and introduce you to some of the people we'll be following in this documentary. These young gents are my three younger cousins and if they are to survive in Bangladesh, they must learn to grow up fast. This is Jamil. He is nine years old and we will be taking a closer look at his life later in this film as he is a true inspiration to all children who are less fortunate. This is Sharjan. He is 11 years old and he lives in a tin house behind Jamil on the family compound. This young fella is Aryan. He is 7 years old making him the youngest male on our compound. He lives in our grandma's house with his parents and older siblings. We will be following these boys throughout this documentary as they will be learning to develop their working skills from this young age. Let's take a look at my family compound, where I have spent the duration of my stay. Living amongst the village life here requires me to adapt to many changes. I will now walk you around my family compound to give you a better understanding of how it looks. There are three generations of my family living here in multiple houses. Jimmy lives here with his parents and younger sister. This is our grandma's house where Ariane stays with his family. Out back, there are two tin houses. Sharjan lives in the first house with his parents and older brother. And in the second house lives another aunt and uncle with two more of our cousins. 
These boys will grow up on this compound until they are men. Over the next few weeks, I intend to expand my knowledge on the process of the annual rice harvest and develop a better understanding of the impact it has on the lives of the local villagers. Their lives depend on this harvest as it will feed their family for the next 12 months. Let's keep in mind that they are required to do this whilst fasting this year. This means working outdoors in extremely hot conditions with no food or water from sunrise till sunset. Jamil's uncle is taking me out into his paddy fields so I can learn more. And this is when it dawns on me just how many rice plants the villagers are expected to cut manually by hand every day this month. Notice how many sections have already been harvested. First thing I notice is that these men are dripping head to toe in sweat, their shirts visibly stuck to their bodies. This is a result of the intense physical labour which is expected of them whilst working under the sun in temperatures of up to 40 degrees Celsius. Rice is the main source of food for over 135 million people in Bangladesh and this country is the third biggest producer of rice in the entire world after India and China. With such a high demand and so few jobs generally available, most people will seek to work in the paddy fields, including the elderly. I aim to find out how the local villagers feel about the annual rice harvest and how they handle the pressures that come with it. Let me introduce you to a local villager named Tukbul who lives in a neighbouring compound. Tukbul has spent his whole life in this village, giving him many years of experience in harvesting rice. He happily agreed to be interviewed for this film and offered to give us more insight into the annual harvest. Pastor dige mama, shokal pura pastor dige. Amra gya khadat lagmu. Pastor dige. Kal pastor dige shesh puriya. Jara dan khade, tarar amra dilai chega poshay dia. Aar amra khetar majhe ta kya mood gula re adai. I am also fasting. However, I can almost guarantee it would be virtually impossible for me to work the standard 12-hour shifts that these villagers are doing. The temperature is 38 degrees Celsius today, and these men have been working since 5 a.m. this morning. Ruja 
রুজা রাখ এই গরমের দা রুজা বাঙ্গিলিত হয় ফানির থিরাসে জিগর ভাইটে জায়গা মামা এত মনে চায় খেতের মাঝে ফানি মুখ লাগাইয়া আস্তা বিল খাইয়া ফলাই দিয়ে এবার ফুকলাই লোকার খিলাই লোকার বান বিল লোকার দিয়ে আর যে সাকানো মন দা চায় এই সময় মামা বিলের ফানি খাই লিতাম এর মাধ্যম আমরা খাই লাই খাই লাই করে ওই যে আপনার কষ্ট রুজার মাসে এই কষ্টটা খুবই মূল্যমান কষ্ট আর যে রোজা ছাড়া আপনার যে কষ্টগুলা এই কষ্টগুলো আপনার শরীরে লাগে না সব বন্ধু বান্ধব হতে একলগে খানি খাদ্য খাই After a few hours, the heat is getting too much for me, so I decide to go home to ensure that I can maintain my fast. By late afternoon, I feel exhausted and I'm really struggling with my fast. So now ask yourself, how must the villagers feel only going home now to break their fast after a 12-hour shift since 5am this morning? Early this morning, Sharjan is getting ready for his day. He takes his routine walk to the neighbor's water pump should he want a drink of water. Sharjan is not as privileged as children in the UK, who are fortunate enough to bathe daily with fresh, hot and clean water. In Sharjan's case, he has access to none, and like the majority of children in Bangladesh, he only has one option. He heads further away from his home and sees his friends as they head for their morning bathe in the local village pond. Sharjan's body has adapted to these waters, although many children in Bangladesh are still affected by waterborne diseases caused by pollution. And like any other day, and like every other child in this village, regardless of the weather, he gets in the cold pond water for his daily morning bath. How long could you survive without hot water? This afternoon's overcast suggests that the weather may stay mild, but before long, the sun is out doing what it does best. Jamil's dad and uncle have arranged for me to go back out today and meet more workers in a different field. Remembering how dehydrated I felt yesterday, I cannot help but wonder how long it will take for the sun to affect me today. It is common to see the paddy field workers wearing these hats which they call a sata. They can offer shade around the eyes, protecting them from the blinding light and can help prevent the body from overheating. These men are in a line formation, advancing through the rice field as they work, rapidly cutting through the rice plants with a curved blade they call a chassi. The second task is to tie the harvested plants into bundles, using the rice plant itself as a bind. These bundles are stacked into big piles on the field and later transported for further processing. The bundles are carried in these baskets which they call an agul and moved from field to roadside before being tucked to a threshing machine. I want to know what keeps these villagers working 12 hours a day in overwhelming heat. <laughs> Mm -hmm. 
the villagers tell me how important it is for them to work in their paddy fields. <laughs> These villagers contribute whatever little earnings they get towards providing for their families and giving their children an education. Manual harvesting, which consists of intensive labour like these men are doing, is extremely common across the Indian subcontinent. Rice is the dominant food crop in Bangladesh and takes up a massive 75% of the agricultural land use. And just like yesterday, the heat is forcing me to struggle with my fasting again after having only been exposed to the sun for a couple of hours. Imagine how these men feel working also with no food or water. Tonight, I cannot deny the feeling that these men go through a lot in order to raise their children or have them tutored, in comparison to the UK, where education is free. So why is it that some parents in UK are too lazy or unconcerned with taking their child to attend school where they can receive an education? Bangladesh has six weather seasons in a year and has some of the most biodiverse climates in the world. The weather is grey this morning from the constant showers of light rain. However, this is an advantage to all those who are fasting. Humidity levels can get very high in Bangladesh. Therefore, when it rains, it cools down the environment which takes the stuffiness out the air. This creates more ideal conditions for those who are fasting. I'm curious to know how the rain will affect the rice harvest or will it cause any damage to the crops and will the villagers still proceed to work in the paddy fields? Not everyone minds the rain. The boys like to have a kick around and laugh at their friends who slip and fall. He has an action replay for those who missed it. The weather is turning torrential and I'm strongly doubting that any villager will be harvesting in this rain. By the time the rain has cleared up, we receive news that two teenage brothers who had been harvesting in this very field during the storm had been struck by lightning and killed on the spot. Their bodies were brought back to the village, however I did not record this graphic scene out of respect. This made me question more than ever, why would some people be willing to risk their lives to harvest their crops? The answer soon becomes apparent, because they have no choice. In this field, I'm noticing that many plants have been destroyed from the heavy rain, and as I cross over it, it only gets muddier and more waterlogged, forcing me to take off my trainers and walk in my socks. Most people in this country depend on this annual harvest to feed their family for one more year. Therefore, those who can't afford to lose it have no choice but to come out and salvage whatever plants remain and have not been damaged in the midst of the storm. Let's take a look at this crop. Most of this section has been blown over and waterlogged from the storm and as a result, 
whoever owns this field can expect to have already lost 20% of his rice. These local villagers are using a larger chassis which is more effective on the damaged plants. The farmer who owns this field has been left in a critical position and he must immediately harvest his crop as he is losing more and more rice by the minute due to water damage. This elderly gentleman has very little food or money to survive on for the rest of the year and has agreed to help the farmer with the cutting of his field. In return, the farmer will pay him with a small percentage of the rice once it has been processed and is complete. Even in this wet state, most of the rice can still be saved, assuming within 24 hours, it has been sent to a threshing machine to be broken down and laid out to dry under the sun. However, if the rice grains are exposed to the water too long, it will spoil and they will not be able to recover it later on. In 2016, the flood waters arrived one month early, destroying nearly 100% of the crops in this village. Let's take a moment to listen to Jamil's dad, who is also my uncle, tell us about the destruction of the flood waters in the year 2016. <laughs> So, phone is to the phone. 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 কোনো দানের উপরে মানুষের সপ্তাহে নির্ভরশীল আস্থা বছর খানি দান বেচা মানে পয়সা কইরা ফ্যামিলি বহুত খামো লাগায় গোর লেখাপড়া বাজার সপ্তাহ করে কিন্তু মানুষের কিটা করত কোনো আইডিয়া নাই পানি দেখিয়া কত মানছে খানছে মানে কোনো আকল নাই আকল গেছে কি মানছে It was clear to see how upsetting it was for Jamil Stad to talk about the year where millions upon millions of people's lives were affected by the destructive floodwaters. I was astonished at how quickly and easily the rice can be spoilt and how the harvest can be affected by the rain. Imagine growing a year's supply of food only to wake up and find it has been destroyed by flood waters. Today, I am going to learn how the rice grains are separated from the plant stalks and have arranged to meet Togbu later this afternoon so I can see one of these threshing machines in action. This machine has an engine which is fueled by gasoline and when put to use, there is a threshing roller inside constantly beating down on the rice plant. Meanwhile, a fan will blow on the stalk. When they are fully separated, they will be discharged through different outlets.
it's now afternoon and I'm taking a walk onto the field behind our compound to meet Thugbull and his workers. They too have just arrived with the threshing machine and are preparing to set it up in place. Before this can be done, they lay a large tarp on the ground as this is where they will be collecting the rice once it falls from the thresher. Once the tarp has been laid out, the heavy machine is pulled into position. All that is left to do now before they start threshing is to balance the machine and secure it into place. The general lack of health and safety rules and regulations in Bangladesh is a major concern. Take a look at this machine for instance. It weighs several hundred kilograms, yet they prop it up with a small plank of wood. This pile of bundled rice plants had been prior bronchia from the paddy fields. They feel much lighter and drier than when they had just been harvested. The men prepare to commence work as they start the engine. Threshing rice requires at least three or four men. The first two villagers will start by running the bundles through the machine. One will pass it from the pile, whilst the other will push it through the threshing roller. Within seconds, the wooden leg support gives way, so they kick the piece of wood back into place and secure the machine to continue with their work. These machines can be extremely dangerous and only a few days ago, a 15-year-old boy caught his hand in the roller and lost four of his fingers. The nearest medical centre is over two hours away from this village. The third man's job is to gather the rice falling from the grain outlet using this tool they call an abra. And once the separation process is complete, the fourth man will gather the stalks to be dried into hay. The invention of the first threshing machine during the early industrial revolution made farming easier and allowed farmers to increase their output and speed of doing things. Now let's fast forward a few hundred years to the current year 2021. Threshing machines were only introduced to Bangladesh no more than 25 years ago, so I ask myself, just how far behind are these villagers from modern times? The next stage in the rice harvest process is to dry and clean the rice ready for being milled locally or sold to larger mills who will remove the husk and bran layers. This is the hard protective outer layers of the grain and once they have been removed they will be sold onto the wider market for global consumption. The villagers will lay the rice grains out to dry in almost anywhere there is space outdoors. The first step to cleaning the rice is to brush out any larger excess such as plant stalks. Notice how the rice behind this lady already looks a lot cleaner compared to the rice in front of her which is still being swept. Once the rice has been dried more, they will be further cleaned and filtered using a second method to remove any spoiled rice grains or smaller excess. Most brushes, including this one, are called a zaru. This brush is made from the stalks that come from coconut tree leaves. As mentioned before, the rice can be found drying literally anywhere, even including the roads. Unfortunately, the drying process is not as easy as leaving the grains under the sun. 
it must be occasionally flipped and turned in order to dry fully and achieve its best quality. It takes the villagers around two days to dry the rice. However, with extremely good weather, it can be dried in one day on a rooftop. Around 10% of the villagers will have a roof on their house. The remaining 90% will have to find open space to dry their rice. It takes 15 days to prepare a drying space in a field as it requires removing the ground surface, which allows the moisture underneath to dry, resulting in a new hardened surface. Drying rice can be challenging at times, and there are several factors to consider when leaving the grains unattended. Cows, for example, if they do not see their owners around, they will not hesitate to eat any drying rice they come across. Another concern for the villagers is if the grains are left exposed to sudden rainfall. This is the case for these men. They've had to regather their rice, which was laid out drying into one mound, and are covering it with a tarp called a thirfal. Tonight, there are many rice mounds left covered on a nearby field, and with all signs suggesting a storm is heading our way, I decide to go check out what precautions the villagers are taking overnight. This third fall has been securely pinned down with large rocks and hay has been placed on top to prevent it catching the wind. Then in the darkness, someone is approaching us with a torchlight. The man is shouting over to us, demanding that we identify ourselves. However, Jamil Stad recognises the voice as one of the local villagers and confirms who we are. This puts the man's mind at rest and then they exchange pleasantries before the villager disappears back into the darkness. It is common for robbers to steal rice left unattended at night time, so the villagers will use bamboo shoots and straw to build these makeshift shelters called an ura. They will sleep next to their rice mounds in these uras during the night. This makes it easier for them to detect any attempted robberies, as they will hear the sound of the tirfal being removed or be able to see the light from any torches. When morning arrives, the villagers will check the condition of the rice and in the event that it has managed to get wet from the rain, they will lay it back out to dry in the sun. Once it is ready, the villagers will proceed to the second stage of cleaning the rice, which can only be done in windy conditions. This part of the process is usually done with this basket called a cooler. First, they will scoop the rice into a basket and release it from a higher height so it catches the wind. Notice how the grains have separated into two sections. The good grains will land closer, whereas the wind will blow the spoilt rice and the excess dirt to the back of the pile. These two sections will then be separated by hand. The clean rice will be took back to the compounds because it is now ready to be stored. The spoilt rice will be thrown away, however extremely poor people often keep it to burn as extra fuel on their cooking fires. Today, Jamil has asked his dad to take him to his school. Schools in Bangladesh have been closed for nearly 18 months now due to the corona pandemic. Jamil peers into his old classroom, which is dark, deserted and silent. The cobwebs on the window suggest how long it has been since a child has been educated in this classroom. Jamil tells me he has been off school so long now he has forgotten some of his classmates' names. Jamil doesn't really understand the Covid pandemic and is under the impression that one day his teachers left and that's why his school has been closed. Jamil has came to see if there are any notices confirming when his school will be back open. All he finds 
is a poster about politics bearing the face of his dad's close friend, the local chairman. <laughs> Imagine you are a child in a third world village. Your school has been closed and you have zero materialism in your childhood. How would you spend your time? Arian's older brother is teaching the boys how to differentiate the numerous strains of rice and it is crucial that they learn from him. Although 15 years old, he is considered an experienced worker. This is Ehia. He is 15 years old and already he is confident working in all different jobs in the village including raising animals, harvesting rice and he is an extremely skilled fisherman as well as being able to do carpentry work in his spare time. He enjoys playing a wide variety of sports including football and is the under 18's district champion in badminton. In the UK, how involved is the average 15-year-old with working in the community? Now the rice has been cut, separated, cleaned and dried. 
the villagers will load the rice into sacks and then these sacks will go one of two ways. Poor villagers will store the rice on their compound to be milled locally for consumption or to be sold to other villagers. However, those who have more pack them up and immediately send them off to mills to be sold. Putting aside rich and poor, over the last few days, it is becoming a lot more frequent seeing the villagers loading rice into sacks. Now we begin to realise there is a lot more processing to be done. Come tomorrow, I am interested to find out what the next stage is for the local villagers now the rice has been processed and packed into sacks. Early this morning, these villagers are taking rice sacks in a pushcart to their compound. During late afternoon yesterday, these men gathered their rice and prepared them into sacks. These sacks would then be piled and covered with a tirfal overnight. Come morning, they're bringing them home. Rice is filled into sacks using baskets. These sacks are then transported to the compounds in the village via several methods. The poorest villagers, including their children, have to carry them back manually to the village, often covering great distances. Some poor children will start helping with this gruelling task from the age of 12. Most villagers will transport their rice to the village using this pushcart called a tiller. Tillers are used when the rice has been dried around a 10-15 minute walk away. Once the tiller arrives at the compound, it will be unloaded. This task requires two people, one person to lift and one person to carry it. Carrying sacks on their head is very common in Bangladesh. Therefore, the villagers are at serious risk of injury to the neck, shoulder, back and arms by attempting to lift and carry these sacks on their own. Horses are another method used to transport rice sacks when their rice has been dried a long distance away and is considered too far to be pushed. These horses come from a town called Tangail. This town is well known for its working horses, an occupation which is considered too much for poor villagers to financially maintain. The main trade in Tangail is hiring out working horses, a trade which has been passed down there for many generations. They have thousands of working horses, which get organised into hundreds of groups and then sent in every direction to work in hundreds of villages. Each group has 11 working horses. It took two days for the group which this horse came with to arrive in this village. This horse groomer is beating away any mosquitoes around the horse with a cloth. This group of horses will sleep in nearby fields for two weeks until their work is done in this village. The horse groomers will sleep in the makeshift uras made from bamboo and straw. After the rice sacks have been brought to the compound, they will be kept in a barn-like house specifically built for storing rice. These rice houses are called a barral. Notice how there is only one entrance to the barrel, which is high up, has a bolt and padlock and requires a ladder to access. This is to prevent robbers stealing on the night time. Inside the barrel, little Arian has been trying to learn work and putting in his fair share of graft for the family. Once the rice sacks have been dropped into the barrel, they will be emptied and the empty sacks will be kept for loading more rice in the future. The extremely poor villagers will use the rice to feed their families and will usually have 5 to 20 sacks. This will last them around 3 months. Richer folk on the other hand will have anywhere up to 500 sacks stored and can feed from it without having to worry about how much they have left. They will store the rice until four or five months down the line when they will sell it to bigger factories or businesses. However, not everyone has a barrel. Most poor villagers will keep their few rice sacks in their already cramped tin houses. In Sharjan's family's case, they will keep it next to their bed. There are two reasons the villagers will come to this local market mill which I have came to visit today. One would be if they are poor and in urgent need of food. 
These people will take their few sacks of dried rice grains to be milled. This is the process of removing the outer layer of the grains, hence making it ready for consumption. Until I learnt about the rice mills, I had been slightly worried about seeing the rice being dried on roads and villagers turning it with their feet. However, now I understand that these outer layers on the grain are taking off by taking it to a rice mill. This local market mill is considered small compared to the larger mills as it wouldn't have any purpose to be any bigger. The villagers don't have to pay for their rice to be milled and can expect it done for free of charge. This is because the mill owner benefits from collecting piles of outer layers of rice and selling it on. This outer layer is called kuda and can be used for fish food, chicken food and feeding cows. The month of Ramadan is over now and soon the villagers will wake up to proceed with hay stacking which is the last stage of the annual rice harvest. Once I awoke from my afternoon nap, I found the boys on this partially made haystack. They told me they were waiting on more hay arriving so they could help out. Jamil's dad has hired this group of young men to build a haystack on our compound. After I show you the enormity of today's task, you will be shocked at how little these men get paid. The boys are very keen to learn about haystacking and watch eagerly as more hay arrives on the compound. Soon they are put to work and giving the task of spreading out the hay and walking round in circles to compact it with their feet. Little Ariane seems to be having a lot of fun. Nonetheless, with temperatures reaching up to 40 degrees Celsius, this work can be exhausting. The boys have a quick rest before jumping off to let the hired men continue building the haystack which they call a lassie. The villagers make these lassies on their compounds in preparation for the monsoon season when the land floods over and the cows will be unable to graze out in the fields. Instead, they can feed the cows daily by pulling away sections of the lassie. The boys are told to come inside and eat their lunch, a meal mainly consisting of rice and potatoes. After hydrating themselves, Jamil is keen to go back out and help with the haystack. After having my own lunch, I came back out to check the progress, only to find it had been covered with a tearful. The boys have went to get more hay, and because they thought it may rain, they have covered it up whilst they are gone. It takes three people to cover it up. One holds the pole in the middle, whilst the other two drape the thirfal over. When the lads have came back with more hay, some of them stop back to crack on with the work as the children prepare to jump on and help out. <laughs> As young as they may be, it's really nice to see how keen the children are to learn from their elders. Jamil's dad has been taking the boys back out to bring more hay, 
although I'm still unsure where it is coming from or what is taking them so long to bring it back. The lassie is gradually growing taller, making it more difficult for the children to climb up and down. Sharjan grabs a ladder made from bamboo sticks and string which they call a moi in Bangladesh. Jamil tells me the reason he chose not to go with his father is so that he could stay back and help the workers whilst learning from them. Jamil looks up to his father a lot and is always enthusiastic about learning from him. When Jamil's dad told him he had learned all this work at the same age as him, naturally he wants to do the same. At this moment, he is still helping the worker spread the hay by hand so it is more evenly spread out. As Sharjan decides to take a break, his brother is on his way to the market to help the family mill their rice. He is helping them for free and will not be getting paid. To make a haystack, a bamboo pole will be placed in the middle to keep the work centred. They do a body span radius around the pole to keep the measurements even. It takes at least a minimum of two people to make a haystack. One will work on the ground and throw up the hay, whilst the second person will be on the top and spreading it out evenly by hand. Ehia has came out to check on Ariane to make sure he is not bothering the men whilst they work. The workers are now both on the ground pulling away straw at the bottom to even the haystack. Unfazed by the heat and still willing to learn, Jamil joins in although he is slightly unsure what he is doing. He asks them how much he should pull away and they explain until he sees a mark etched into the ground. Earlier today, a radius line was drawn around the pole and marked into the ground. They will go all the way around in a complete circle, pulling away at the lower section of the straw until it is levelled with the mark on the ground. <laughs> Similar to the paddy field workers, these men are sweating head to toe. Their shirts are literally stuck to their backs. After a while, Jamil's dad and the boys have still not returned, leaving me wondering what is taking them so long. Meanwhile, those who have stayed back continue with their work and I notice Jamil brushing up behind them to help out. Eventually, a few of the boys have came back with more hay. However, on his way in, one of the lads has knocked a power cable, bringing the pole down and causing an injury to his head. This time when the boys go for more hay, I decide to join them. After walking around one kilometre, we see Jamil's dad. He has been waiting until the workers come back and without wasting any time, they get straight back to work. This worker is wrapping a cloth around his head called a gamsa, which has two purposes. 
One is to protect the head from the spiky hair and dust that falls from it, and the other is to protect them from the sun. Jamil tells his dad that one of the workers has received an injury and when asked if he needs any time off, he insists that he is fine to work. At this moment in time, as I watch, I don't really have much of an idea as to what is happening. So far, I've gathered that they are laying ropes on the ground, collecting hay and spreading it over the rope. Jamil is also learning and trying to understand the work that he is seeing in front of him. However, soon after I start to make sense of what they are doing, I realise they have laid ropes on the ground and are placing hay on top so they can roll it up into a smaller haystack which is called a kheridata, which will be carried back to the compound. All this will be done under the heat of the scorching sun. The rope laid out for the first haystack is making progress and looks ready to be rolled up soon. As the hay which had been laid out under the sun to dry is being gathered, Jamil helps out as they lay out the second line for the next haystack. In total, there will be four haystacks made now, one for each worker that is present. As hard as he may work, Jamil is distracted by the sound of children playing along the road, as I remind myself he is only a child. It takes three people to make a khedadata. One person will pull the ropes on the ground to keep it tightened, as the second person compacts it down with his body weight and pulls it inwards. A third person will push it from the outside, and once rolled up, they will tie the strings to keep it in shape. And now, that's one down, and three more still to make. It seems I had underestimated the sheer amount of work that is put into making these little haystacks, which will then get carried back to the compound. Jamil is given the responsibility of pushing from the outside, now that he has a better understanding of the task at hand. The second Khedadata is tied and ready now, so Jamil continues to help them as they move on to the third. Once each haystack is ready, they must be manually transported, and because each one weighs up to 70 kilograms in weight, it takes two people to lift it up before the workers start to the difficult task of walking back over a kilometre away to the compound whilst carrying it on their head. Let me remind you that this is their fifth trip out here today since they started work this morning.
it is not unusual to see children working in Bangladesh. In fact, it is very common to see poor children working from a young age, whereas children who are too young to work will be left to play outdoors. These children are playing on a concrete power pole that has fallen over. Now that fasting is over and I am allowed to eat and drink through the daytime, I still find myself struggling to cope with this heat. Jamil's dad and one of his uncles helped the last remaining worker prepare the khiridata for the next worker that arrives. There isn't much work left to be done in this field now, as most of the hay that had been left here drying since yesterday has been gathered, rolled up into haystacks and transported back to the compound. Jamil's dad is both aware and considerate of how difficult the work is for these hired men, hence he is only taking a rest once most of the work has been done and there is limited amount left. And in what seems like no time at all, and despite having travelled back and forth from this field today, one of the workers has returned to help carry the last two haystacks. These boys have now tirelessly carried around 70 kilograms back and forth from our compound over a kilometre each way, whilst barefoot in 39 degrees heat, which leaves me questioning how urgently do these boys need to earn money. On our way back to the compound, just behind the market I see some local familiar faces and they ask me to take a group photo. Jamil is helping his uncle make a tool called an asra, which will be used to comb the haystack. This is made from bamboo, wood and nails. The haystack is around 9 foot high now, nearing the top of the pole. Once the hay reaches the top of this pole, they will stop spreading it out and make the haystack a pointed shape at the top. The boys continue to work as fast as they can so they can get back home to their children. It's turning late afternoon and the boys have been working now for 7 hours in the unbearable heat from the sun. Jamil, who watched how the Astra is made, has seen how the villagers use it on other occasions and gets straight to work combing the haystack. Now that the haystack is growing taller, Jamil's dad has climbed onto the roof to get a better view to advise the lads on their work. Meanwhile, Jamil has decided to get on the roof himself and is kindly offering the workers mangoes from one of our trees. The lads agree, and Jamil rips off and throws them each a mango. The boys are grateful for the little bit of sweet energy they gain from the fresh fruit. The heat had really got me drained, and I decided to have a short nap. As the late afternoon prepared to set into early evening, I came back out, however there wasn't a soul in sight. The haystack was not complete, so at first I assumed the boys had called today. But soon I noticed all the boys' work gear had been left lying out, and moments later I found them washing their hands and faces at the water pump. Now that fasting is over, Jamil's dad can offer the hired workers into his house to share food whilst they have a rest and refuel. Everyone tucks in as they load their plates with rice and pass around the chicken, fish and beef dishes cooked by Jamil's mother. The boys have been fed and because they have used everything in the previous field, they will now go to a different one to bring more hay. Back on the compound, little Arian is trying to practice his combing skills with the Asra whilst Jamil shows him how to flip the hay. Children in Bangladesh are very motivated to always be learning. They enjoy to play out and are not only at one with nature, but also with the paths that are laid out for their future. They happily work on the land and learn from their elders until they are teenagers and able to work themselves.
It's not just the children, though, who are at peace with their struggles in life. The boys, too, have a joke around and laugh whilst they work. As it turns evening, the boys prepare to try and complete the haystack and I can't help but wonder how much the arms must be aching from the hours of carrying and throwing hay. I asked the lads if they were getting tired and they joked on saying they could do this for 24 hours a day. Once the haystack gets too high to walk around in order to compact the hay, a bamboo shoot is used to beat the hay down as they work. Any hay that falls off will be regathered and thrown back up. The sun has went down now and night's darkness falls on us. Jamil's dad is still on the roof helping the boys stay on track as they persist to throw up the hay. However, the boys are struggling to see in the dark now, so Jamil's dad climbs from roof to roof until he is in a better position to help by holding a flashlight for the boys. The boys are exhausted, yet keen to finish this haystack as they draw nearer to completion as they have made contact with another villager who wants a haystack made the following day. The race is on to finish the job tonight. Now that it is dark, I can feel the mosquitoes biting and no doubt they are biting the boys too. However, these lads are adapted to this country and mosquitoes do not affect them very much. I hand the boys some bottles of juice to keep them hydrated. The village is very dark now, only dimly lit by the crescent moon, so here are some photos to show you the progress. These villagers earn very little money. Nonetheless, as long as they are working, they are happy with their lives. The haystack is nearly finished now and the boys have been working since 10am. Only one worker remains on the haystack now that it is taking shape and beats down the last of the hay on the top. Jamil's dad prepares to put the final touch on the haystack, a long piece of rope which will have two bricks tied to it. One of the workers prepares the brick by chipping a groove into it with a heavy thick machete called a da. The reason for this is to ensure the brick stays firmly tied to the rope. This rope and brick device will then be placed on the haystack with the centre of the rope going over the topmost point whilst the bricks will hang down on opposite sides. This will be done twice until there are four bricks 90 degrees apart from each other. The purpose of doing this is to help the haystack maintain its shape at the top during windy or stormy conditions.
As the worker pats down the last of the hay, Jamil Stard prepares another device to pass up the rope and brick to the worker. This will be done by placing a smaller bamboo shoot into a larger bamboo. The smaller bamboo shoot will have a piece of wood tied to the end. The rope will then be tied to the wood on the end by using the rope nearer to the brick so it bears the weight easier and does not swing whilst hoisting it up. Once the worker can reach it, he will carefully untie the rope and be guided from below as he lowers the brick onto the opposite side. Once the ropes and bricks have been secured in place, I can't help wonder how the last worker plans to get down. <laughs> Jamil Stad passes up a large bamboo chute which is known for its extreme tensile strength and the ground worker's support as they strengthen the grip on the bamboo to hold it firmly in place for the worker to climb down. I feel slightly nervous in case he slips and falls. However, this is not the first time he has lowered himself down from a haystack like this. Once the last worker has finally made his way down, the workers gather around to inspect the job that they have done. আমরা কৃষি কাজ না করলে আমরা শরীরে আলি তোমার কিছু কিছু কামরা এই কাজ না করলে আমরা ভালো লাগে না These boys have worked an exhausting 12 hour shift in extreme heat for only 600 takas in english money that converts to 5 pound and 15 pence If you were to work and earn the same how much of your daily expenses would this wage cover This morning, I still can't get my head around how little the boys got paid for how much work they did and I find myself admiring their positive attitudes towards earning only 600 takas each. Now that it is daylight, let's take a look at the haystack that the boys built. <laughs> Everyone is fortunate enough to hire a large group to build their haystack. In the neighbour's case, they aren't as well known as Jamil Stad, hence the only two men are making the full haystack. Today, I want to learn more about how the rice is sold which people store on their compound. Poor villagers will ask local villagers if they want to buy any rice or in many cases, the buyers will be aware of the people who are selling. Let's take a look at a small sale between two local villagers on a compound. Rice is weighed up on old-fashioned scales called a fala, and they work by placing weights on one side and the produce on the other until they balance out. In this instance, they are using 5 kilogram weights and weighing the rice into 50 kilogram sacks. The buyer will always bring associates when buying and weighing the rice locally. The seller will load the rice onto the scales whilst the buyers will weigh it up and load it into sacks. Both sides will bear witness that the sacks have been weighed out honestly to the correct weight, and when this is done, the buyer will pay the seller and part ways. When rice is sold in bigger amounts, they are sold to a rice mill. Jamil's dad has brought me to his friend's mill to show me how rice is sold on a larger scale. People who will sell to the larger rice mills are usually farmers with big plots of land or villagers in the rice business who buy smaller amounts from other villagers until they have enough to sell it to the mill. Each sack weighs 60 to 70 kilograms and a record is kept of every individual sack that comes in. Then they will be taken inside. <laughs> 
Jamil Stad has went to the owner's office to say hello whilst I am allowed to wander around the mill to see what goes on inside. My first impression is surprised at how many sacks are being stored here. Take a look. Every sack will be milled, removing the outer surface of the grains and repacked into company branded sacks. These sacks will then be sold on to big business owners from all the main trading hubs in Bangladesh, such as Chittagong, Silet, and the capital city Dhaka. Similar to the milling machine in the local market, the rice will go through the same process until it is ready for consumption and poured into sacks. This is the last stage of the milling process. The new grains are sifted through this large shaking mesh so that any stones or excess do not get released. Only the rice grains will fall through before finally pouring out into a sack. These workers have enough experience to judge the right amount of rice going in and once it is around 50 kilograms, they will put it on digital scales and add or remove until it is exactly 50 kilograms. Once it is correct, the sacks are sewn together using this handheld device and then stored for further sale. As this harvesting season comes to an end, the floodwaters will soon begin to rise, making way for the original boat builders. Join us next time when we experience first-hand building a boat from scratch with no power tools, ready for the monsoon season. <laughs> So by the way, Beran Jaitele, Town Jaitele, Halib Boat Lago, Boat Side of Valley Boat Lago, Mass Margo, Manchaburdi, Manchabon and Bogi Bordi, Manaboats are a good hamna, Halib Boat Ramambra, other other boats are good.